Organic evolution is the one we're going to cover right now. Organic evolution is how life supposedly has started spontaneously from non-life by accident without intelligence. Now, the fact is we can't even create life on purpose with intelligence as it stands right now. Darwin said, if it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed, my theory would absolutely break down. Darwin wrote this in 1859. He didn't know the structure of a cell. It was unknown at that time. They didn't know how it was like, and Darwin was hoping that it was no, com more, no more complicated than a simple little jelly. All right, that was his hope. So let's see how life started according to the books we have today. This one says, 4.6 billion years ago, Earth cooled down and formed a rocky crust. This one says, the planet cooled and a rocky surface was created. This is what our kids are being told. And then it continues saying, Earth's surface was hot and there were large pools of bubbling lava. Oceans formed as it rained on the rocks for millions of years. This textbook says, millions of years of torrential rains created great oceans. This same book continues saying, swirling in the waters of the oceans is a bubbling broth of complex chemical. And it goes on to say, progress from a complex chemical soup to a living organism is very slow. I agree with that. It's so slow, it hasn't happened yet. We have never seen it, and it hasn't happened. No, I, have, I do have a lot of debates on the internet about the subject of or organic evolution. And um, evolutionists like to mock creationists, and they say, you creationists are so dumb, you believe in, say, 6,000 years old universe. And I tend to remind them that they believe we came from a rock. So they say, no, we don't. And usually I respond like this, and we can make a note of this. I can send you a copy of this if you like. And this has come straight from textbooks to help them understand, bless them. I write back something like this. 4.6 billion years ago, the Earth cooled down, in brackets, from a rock, and formed a rocky crust from rock. Earth's surface was hot, that's rock, and there were large pools of bubbling lava from melted rock. Oceans formed as it rained on the rocks, rock, for millions of years, swirling in the waters of the oceans and bubbling broth of complex chemical soup to a living organism, all from rock. Normally when I put a comment like that, that would be the end of the conversation. I don't normally get replies. It, uh, I don't know what happens to them. They obviously get a shock. So let's find out what life really looks like. Was Darwin right? Are our textbooks right? Let's have a look. Well, it turns out that a simple cell that's a single-celled organism like paramecium is more complex than a space shuttle. A person has over 50 trillion cells. Each cell is more complicated than a fully functioning city. Each human cell has a complete database that in the center of it holding every single bit of information about the human body. And this is called DNA, all right? This is a, which stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. That's a mouthful. Now, that doesn't look like a jelly, does it? That's a close view for you. DNA is made of chromosomes, and we have 46 of those, and we call them DNA. These are the facts. We have 10 fingers because our DNA says so. We have two arms, two legs because our DNA says so. The DNA is a complete pro a, a storage system that keeps note of every, how we're made up, our structure, our entire structure, like the ear, our digestive system, the eyes, the nose, how we breathe. Every th single part of our body is made up because our DNA says so. That's how they're both put together. It's one super massive database. The DNA is spread across 46 chromosomes. You get 23 from each one of your parents. 23 comes from each one. Put them together, you get 46. Now, if we have evolved, then clearly we would start with less chromosomes, wouldn't we? And as we become more complex, you get more chromosomes into your DNA. That would be the thinking behind it, right? And that's what evolutionists would want you to believe, that we started simple and became more complicated. Well, if that's the case, have a look at this. We as humans have got 46 chromosomes. Obviously, before we evolved into humans, we must have been a bat, because that has 44 chromosomes. And before that, you were a wheat, and before that, you were a soybean. Obviously, if you believe in evolution, then clearly you would then evolve into having more chromosomes into your DNA, so you can look forward to becoming a tobacco <laughs> with 48 chromosomes, and of course into a chimp and an amoeba. Here's an interesting fact. If all the chromosomes from one person were stretched out and laid end-to-end, -end, it would stretch from here 
from Earth to the Moon and back 550,000 times. That is a lot of information in your body. That's where it is. The average human has over 50 trillion of those cells. Yet, if you put them all together, if you take all the DNA in your body and you put them together, it will just about fill two tablespoons. That's an incredible fact. The DNA holds so much information that if it was typed out and filled in a book, it will fill the Grand Canyon 78 times. To give you an appreciation, let's say how big is the Grand Canyon. The Grand Canyon is 277 miles long, 18 miles wide, and over a mile deep. That's a lot of space, and it fills that giant hole 78 times. Let's put things in perspective a little bit. The power of a computer system is measured by its processing power and the capacity by which it stores information, how much information it stores. Well, as of May 2010, this is hot out of the press, if you want the most powerful supercomputer, you would want the Cray Jaguar computer. This is the fastest supercomputer around. I know my son is going to end up buying one of those. I'm sure, where is he? There you go. They had to invent new numbering systems to measure its power. You must be aware of terabytes. Are we all aware of terabytes so far? Everybody's aware of terabytes? Okay, well, they had to go up to something else called petabytes. One petabyte is equal to 1,000 terabytes. Well, that wasn't enough. And by the way, one petabyte is the equivalent to the contents of all the academic libraries in America, all of them, just one, one petabyte. Okay, well, that wasn't enough, so they had to go up to an exabyte. An exabyte is 1,000 petabytes. Just in case you're interested, five exabytes is equal to all the words that was ever spoken by everyone who has ever lived. And that's five exabytes. Well, exabyte wasn't enough, so they had to go up to yottabytes. Yottabyte is a thousand exabytes. Okay, well, then that wasn't enough. They had to go up to a zettabyte. A zettabyte is a thousand yottabytes. In August 2010, this is hot press, hot news. The Telegraph announced that in May 2010, the digital universe, that's the entire world's database, electronic data held by all the computers in the entire world, including mobile phones, internet, YouTube, Facebook, blogs, PCs, cameras, washing machine toasters, and memory sticks. Every single memory, if you put them together, it's expected to reach 1.2 zettabytes of information. That's in 2010. That's a lot of information. This is the equivalent of, who's got an iPad? Just one person. And again, my son. If you've got an iPad, that's the equivalent of 75 billion iPads. That's equivalent storage. Okay, that's quite a lot. And in the next, apparently in the next 10 years, it's expected to grow 44 times larger. That is quite a lot of information. Now get this. The DNA database is still more complex and still hold more information than all the computer programs ever written in the history of mankind. That is complicated. Now, it gets more interesting. From the moment of conception until birth, a child will produce 15,000 cells per minute. And each one of those cells is more complicated than a space shuttle. Fancy working for a factory that produces 15,000 space shuttles per minute. Fancy working for a factory that produces those and you are responsible for supply of material. Huh? You have to produce enough material to cover 15,000 space shuttles per minute. Right, what are the chances that this DNA could have put itself together by pure chance? Well, the estimate is one chance in 10 to the power of 119,000. That's 10 followed by 119,000 zeros. Now, I'm sure you just cannot comprehend how big that is, so I'm going to help you a little bit here. The universe is estimated to be 20 billion light years across. From the, that's the universe that we can see. That means if you were to travel at the speed of light, which is 186 mile, million miles per second, and you travel for 20 billion years, you will reach the, sp the distance that we can see at the moment, or at least the one we think uh, we can see. So it will be silly for us to measure this distance in something smaller like miles, okay? That would make it a very large number, so much, so large that you can't comprehend. It would be even sillier to measure it in inches, wouldn't it? 
Well, let's do that. If we measure the entire universe in inches, the distance will be 10 to the power of 28. If I'd said it was 10 to the power of 29, that would have made it 10 times larger than 10 to the power of 28. If I'd said 10 to the power of 30, that would have been 10 times larger than that. So every time you add a zero, it's 10 times larger. Well, let's get the DNA now. The DNA is 10 to the power of 119,000. Let's see if I can explain it in a different way. How many of you would like to win or find the winning lottery ticket in the street just randomly? Okay. I didn't even say it, you just said win, and your hand went straight up. I like that. Just say, I'm having some of that. I don't care. Win, yes, I'm having some of that. How many of you would love to win or, or find at the winning lottery ticket in the street by ch pure chance? How many of you would, okay, same. Um, <laughs> how many of you would like to win it every single week? Find it, if it's still you? Okay. How many of you would like to do this for a thousand years? Win, find the winning lottery ticket pure, by pure chance in the street every week for a thousand years. Well, if you were to do that, the chances of that happening would be 10 to the power of 65. That's 10 followed by 65 zeros. But the DNA, the chances of that happening by pure chance, it's 10 to the power of 119,000. Are we beginning to build a picture here? I don't think so. Now, think of the whole universe and all the planets that exist everywhere. Think about a whole universe, okay? The, the universe is pretty large, and we've just heard that it's 76 trillion stars out there. So that's a lot of stars, right? Well, I want you to think of the universe in terms of atoms. How many atoms could there be? Imagine you're going to snatch one atom by pure chance and get it right. What are the chances of that happening? Well, the chances of that happening is 10 to the power of 80 of snatching one atom from a universe by pure chance and get it right. Well, DNA, by chance alone, would be 10 followed by the 119,000. Are we clear on this? Are we very clear? Do I have to keep going? No, right? Okay, I'll do, I will do, no, I'm kidding, I won't do anymore. This guy says, nobody knows how a mixture of lifeless chemicals spontaneously organize themselves into the first living cell. Do you know what that means? It's guesswork, they don't know, they've just guessed it. Oh, and nobody knows. Nobody knows. This expert says, even with DNA sequence data, we have no direct access to the process of evolution, so objective reconstruction of the vanished past can be achieved only by creative imagination. So, what do you need to do this? You need imagination. So, how good are you with imagination? So, is this science? Is this based on evidence? It's imagination. Here's this textbook. It says, the history of life on Earth began spontaneously 3.5 billion years ago. How this occurred has been and will continue to be a topic of inquiry. Let me translate this to you. Okay, read between the lines. It says, it's okay to inquire about how life evolved, but not okay to inquire whether it evolved. That's not allowed. This encyclopedia says, origin of species not addressed in 1859 and still a mystery in 1998. Both the origin of life and the origin of the major groups of animals remains unknown. Something tells me they're not sure how it all happened. That definitely is very clear. Now, if it didn't happen by accident, then how did it happen? This guy called Sir Frederick Hoyle, he said, the mathematical probability of life starting from inanimate matter is so high that it's enough to bury Darwin and the whole theory of evolution. There was no primeval soup, neither on this planet nor on any other, and if the beginnings of life were not random, they must therefore have been the product of purposeful intelligence. In a nutshell, any other way is made up. There is absolutely no evidence to support this, and they still at it, organic evolution. Despite that, in December 2002, Natural Magazine said, life on Earth may have began in the, cr in the in crust on the ocean floor. More than four billion years ago, two biologists are proposing. The idea leaves many questions unanswered. Let's get this straight. It may have began in rocks. Can you say it may have began in rocks? So is this science? May have and proposing? Is that science? I don't think so. It leaves many questions unanswered. Hmm, I think it does. So, what if the theory is wrong? When will we let go of it? When will it happen? Is this science? I thought science is something we can test and we can observe and we can demonstrate. 
hop, grasshopper, hop. The biology textbook says the first living cell emerged between 4 billion and 3.8 billion years ago. There's no record of the event. Is this saying we know it happened, but we have no proof, no evidence? Is this what it's saying? How do we know it happened then? Yeah, how do we know? It's just made up. That's the truth. And then on the next page, same book, it says the first self-replicating system must have emerged in the organic soup. So let's translate this. We will keep this theory even if we have no evidence. Also, watch out for the word must have emerged. It all happened magically. If I said it happened magically, I'm told I'm religious. That's, that's interesting, isn't it? So is that how it must have happened? Let's have another look at our evolution chart now. 20 billion years ago, the Big Bang. 4.6 billion years ago, the Earth forming. Around about 3 billion years ago, life appears from a rock and found someone to marry. It's quite romantic, really. <laughs> I mean, it's what's going on. I wonder whether God saw all this nonsense ahead of time and he had anything to say about it and to warn us about it. Let's have a look. All right, in Jeremiah 2.27 it says, You say to a stock, you are my father, and to a stone you give birth to me. Ah, the Bible, scientifically accurate again. Even predicting what some religions were going to come up with. How amazing. Next. So what is the bottom line? Well, ev organic evolution is not even wrong, is it? It's not even wrong. So it couldn't have started by chance, therefore it didn't. All right, to say anything else, well, organic evolution is not science. We're going to look at macroevolution. This is a fancy word that evolutionists use to describe how one kind of animal can change from one type to completely another. Macroevolution, M-A-C-R-O. It's, uh, it's, it's sort of the concept of a dog can produce a cat, a flower or a banana can make a donkey. All right, that is the idea of what macroevolution is. So when you're talking about evolution, it's very important you know what they're talking about. And most of the time, that's what they're trying to sell you. That's the idea they're trying to sell you. So let's see, first of all, what Darwin said about what he thinks the theory is all about. If my theory were true about slow, gradual changes, numberless intermediate varieties must assuredly have existed. So if he's right, we'll see plenty of evidence everywhere. Well, that's a fair comment, isn't it? The guy comes up with a theory, give him some space. He comes up with a theory and he says, if I'm right, you'll find this. And if you don't find it, what do you do? You let go, all right? Unless it's a religion. Let's see what the book says about this. Since Darwin, many links have been found. Okay, interesting. Apparently, we have many links. Well, that's pretty promising. So that's good. Well, let's see what our curriculum, the British curriculum, says we should teach our kids. The British single and double, science key stage four. Okay, I'm showing you just a single, but it is both of them, single and double. I've got copies I can send you if you want. It says, the fossil record is evidence for evolution. It makes me laugh when I read those. It really does. Students surely are forgiven if they thought there is now evidence. Well, if the curriculum is saying it, surely they wouldn't lie. Well, let's see if this is right. Dr. Belinsky, who teaches in many universities, this is a very famous guy. He's, he's written many books. He's really clever. Um, and, and most of the time, all he's saying is saying, look, I'm not a Christian. I'm just going to tell you the way it is. All right? This is very fair and honest. There are gaps in the fossil graveyard, places where there should be intermediate forms, but where there is nothing whatsoever instead. No paleontologist writing in English, French, or German denies that this is so. It is simply a fact Darwin's theory and the fossil record are in conflict. Hmm. So there's no evidence. That's interesting. Well, what about what the curriculum said? What about what Darwin said? The Science Magazine said, In the years after Darwin, his advocates hoped to find predictable progressions. In general, these have not been found. Yet the optimism has died hard, and some pure fantasy has crept into textbooks. Is this suggesting that we're now fantasizing that this theory is actually... We're fantasizing fossils. Is that what we're doing? This is a guy called Stephen Jay Gould. He's hardcore evolutionist. He says, as Darwin noted in The Origin of Species, the abrupt emergence of arthropods in the fossil record during the Cambrian presents a problem for evolutionary biology. There are no obvious simpler or intermediate forms, either living or in the fossil record. That is a confession. This evolutionist has written many books as well, yet the transition from spineless invertebrates 
to the first backboned fishes is still shrouded in mystery, and many theories abound. The encyclopedia says, both the origin of life and the origin of major groups of animals remain unknown. What are they teaching our kids? Are they teaching our kids lies? If these are facts and they're saying we've got nothing, why are they teaching our kids otherwise? Why is the curriculum saying what it's saying? Why are they still hang up on this theory? There is no fossil evidence. There is nothing at all. The question should be, can fossils ever be used as evidence for evolution? I, I want you to think about this, and I want you to use this when you're discussing it with people. This is very, very important. Let's just say, think about this. Let's just say you find some fossils in the dirt. Let's just say you do that. What do you know about this fossil? All you know is that it died. That's all you know about it. You don't even know where it died. It could have died somewhere and buried there. That's all you know. You don't know anything. You don't know if it had kids. You sure don't know if it had different kids. Why should that fossil be able to produce something that animals today cannot produce? And you don't know if it survived. If it had kids, how would you know that it survived? It may have not even survived. So let's imagine this. You're in the court of law, and some evolutionist brings in some fossil and says, Your Honor, this fossil proves that these, this is our ancestor. Uh, well, any graduate lawyer, lawyer would be able to say, Your Honor, we don't know if this fossil is the ancestor of anyone. That's the truth, right? So fossil records never count. It never counts. So why are they teaching our kids this rubbish? Did you know that the British Museum here in England has got the largest fossil collection in the entire world? That's the British Museum here. But when a senior paleontologist was asked why he didn't show the missing links in his book, he said, I fully agree with your comments on the lack of evolutionary transitions in my book. If I knew of any fossil or living, I would certainly have included them. I will lay it on the line there is not one such fossil. There is no missing links. In fact, the whole chain is missing. That is absolutely true. Stephen Jay Gould said, the absence of fossil evidence for intermediate stages has been a persistent and nagging problem for evolutionists, yet they are teaching that still, and it still exists in British museums. If you go to British museums today, this is what you see. I took those pictures myself. It says, our living relatives. That's right. It says, our closest living relatives, our fossil relatives. Different stands, different places. Subliminal messages all the way through. And according to Colin Patterson, who worked there, he said that no, there is no such fossil evidence. There is no fossil evidence at all. Yet they're selling it as a fact. You go there, it's a fact. How can this be true without any evidence whatsoever? How could it all be true? But you could be here today and you say, well, what is the big deal? I was never taught evolution in school. It was never told to me that it was as a fact. I've never been brainwashed. So what if they teach this? I don't think I was ever taught this. Well, we're going to examine this right now. How many of you have heard of cavemen? That's nearly everybody. Okay. In fact, I'll be surprised if everyone hasn't actually heard of cavemen. You've been told that we've came from ape-like creatures. That's where the caveman idea comes from. We've been told this in schools, museums, and listen to this, parks. Children go to parks to have fun. They've been told that we come from an ape-like creature. That's where we come from. We have all been brainwashed. We've all been told these rubbish. All right, so we've come from um, apparently ape-like creatures. Well, let's see if this is possible. Is there any evidence? Well, let's start with Nebraska man. Did you know with Nebraska man, all they found is one tooth? A guy called Harold Cook in 1922, so that's uh, pretty recent, found a tooth in America and in a place called Nebraska, which borders Colorado. He said that it looked to him as if this tooth was halfway between an ape-like tooth and a human-like tooth. Well, I, he concluded from that that obviously it belonged to an animal that was halfway between the two. They built a whole skeleton around this. I mean, it's absolutely, they built a whole skeleton around one tooth. How did they know to build a whole skeleton around one tooth? And they made the guy a wife. You've got to be really good to <laughs> you've got to be really good to make a wife from a tooth. <laughs> that picture, they gave it a fancy name by the way. They called it Hesperopithecus, uh, Harold Cookie, and they put it in a museum. And this picture appeared in the Illustrated London News Times in 1922. They went on claiming that this is proof for evolution. 
They were mocking people. They're saying, how can you not believe in evolution now? Look, we've got proof. They went around doing this. They mocked people and all it was is a tooth. You might think that's funny. <laughs> but this is where it came from. It turned out that it came from a pig. And it's still alive in South America, running around quite happily. At that time, they aged this tooth six million years old. And you know why they did that? Because apparently they found it in a geologic column, a geologic layer, and that's how they aged it. These are the layers they made up. Well, they found it in one of those layers that made it six million years old. So much for aging rocks, isn't it? Nebraska man, proof of evolution. Might as well put hop, grasshopper hop right underneath that. Okay, we're going to look at the next one, which is Piltdown Man. Piltdown Man. This was found in 1912 by an amateur archaeologist called Charles Dawson and a French faithful Catholic priest who loved the evolution theory called Pierre de Chardin and a few other people, by the way, who were looking for evidence for evolution. This evolution theory now has been around for 50 years and they're getting quite desperate. We need to find proof. We need to find proof. All right? So this guy, or these guys, took a human skull and a jawbone of an orangutan. They broke the hinges, filed down the teeth, they uh, treated the jaw with acid, and they put some chemicals, stained it a little bit, and went out and buried it in a gravel pit. That's right, they went out and buried it in the gravel pit. So a few days later, they went out fossil hunting as they normally would do, and guess what they found? They found proof for evolution. They planted it there themselves. This became known as a Piltdown Man because they buried it in a place called Piltdown, which is in Barkham, Manor, East Sussex, near London. That's the map if you ever want to go down there. And by the way, if you ever did go down there, there is a place where you can have, apparently, coffee and meals and stuff. Apparently, it's a good place, but unlike what the name suggests, it's not free. But you can't miss it. That picture will help you find it. And guess what? Soon after the fossil was found, this thing that they made up, this is what they did. They hit the headlines. Darwin's theory is proved true. That's what happened. And they kept this hoax going for 40 years. Here, listen. If you were going to school during those years and you were told that their evolution is true and there is the proof for it for 40 years, you would have been brainwashed during those times that evolution is true, right? Who would unbrainwash you after that when the hoax came out? No one. You would be remained with the idea that evolution is true even though they came up with the idea. Because they go around saying it's proof, it's proof, it's a fact, and they only base it on one fossil they made up. But they add all the other ingredients to it, making you think that they've got many proofs. But this is what they had during this time. It was placed in the British Museum, and the same guy submitted more fossils for them to put in the British Museum. So they kept it going. Oh, yeah, they were very good at this. They were very, very good. Now, you see, the way it works is like this. Somebody finds a fossil in the ground. What they don't do is send them out for people to look at. What they do, they create a replica for it. They keep the original, send the replica for everybody to examine it. So what happened? The Piltdown Man was sent everywhere with their replicas. No one saw the original. And they did research papers on this, about 500. Hey, listen, 500 research papers cannot possibly be wrong, can it? Well. It turned out that it was a hoax, because what happened is one guy thought, wait a minute, let's examine the original. Out of the blue, just like that, let's go and examine the original. So he took it under a microscope and he started checking it out and he said, whoa, somebody's fouled down the teeth. And this doesn't match, and that doesn't match. And before you knew it, he turned around and he said, wait, 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 it's one big hoax. It wasn't true. So later, they dated the fossil to be 800. That's a skull cap. It turned out only to be 800 years old, and the jawbone was about 100 years old. Nothing to do with each other, and they were very recent, and it came from a, an orangutan. Eventually, in 1953, they discovered that it was a hoax, so that's 1953. Um, and this is where they originally got the idea that the brain must have expanded before language did. And they still carry it today. Oh, the brain expanded, and we have got proof of it here. And that was Piltdown Man. It was just a hoax. We're going to move on to Neanderthal. I can't go through all the fossils. I'm just going to go through a few. You'll be pleased to hear. Here's another one that's found in the books still today. It's called uh, ne Neanderthal Man because it was found in Neander Valley in Germany. It was named that because of a Christian guy who lived there. It was named after him called Joachim Neander. Joachim Neander was a Christian who actually composed some Christian songs we sing today in our churches. And the song here is, Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. O my soul, praise him, for he is thy health 
and salvation. Do you sing that here, Andrew? Is that sung here? That's where it comes from. Satan doesn't like that, you see. So he had to go in there and cause some damage in the place where um, Joachim Neander lived. This is the valley it was found in. This is where they found some bones. In the same valley, they also found some human bones, by the way. Now, the reason they said that this is um, halfway man and halfway ape is because his back was bent over a little bit. It wasn't the missing link. It was just had a back that was bent over. So 50 years ago, they found out that it was bent over like that because of arthritis. The guy was diseased. He had an illness. It was bent over because of arthritis or rickets. He wasn't part human and part ape. A doctor called Cuozo spent a couple of decades of his life examining this very fossil, and this is what he's actually written about it. He said, you must understand that this skull really cries out disease. The teeth are badly decayed, and the bones of the vault of the skull are extremely thick. There are many features that testify of acromegaly, which is a chronic disease that causes uh, enlargement of bones, or excess secretion of growth hormone in adulthood. Neanderthal man was just fully human. That was sick. That's all it was. Fully human. Yet it's still in our textbooks today. It's still in the British Museum today and still used as proof of evolution. It makes you laugh. It really does. Just purely deformed body. That's all it was. It was it's a hope grasshopper hope situation. It turned out that the evolutionists are so desperate to find some proof, they use Neanderthal as a proof. Some key people, listen to this, some key people even today are lying about this. And, and I, this is what I need you to pay attention to now. Look at this. It's a news article that appeared on the 19th of February 2005 in The Guardian about a professor who for 30 years, listen to this, deliberately falsified all the skull dates to fit the theory. You wouldn't think this would happen these days, would you? This, uh, this professor named Reiner Proch von Zieten, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right. If not, I apologize. It's just, um, this is just some part of his report. And please, if you want to see the full report, I can send you an email. Um, you can ask me later. I'll email it to you, or we'll put it perhaps on the website. I'll give you a link. The link is right up there at the top. I'm going to read through a snippet of what this guy has done. This appeared on the 19th of February, 2005. Yesterday, his university in Frankfurt announced the professor had been forced to retire because of numerous falsehoods and manipulations. According to experts, his deceptions may mean an entire trench of the history of man's development will have to be rewritten. Anthropology is going to have to completely revise its pictures of modern men say Thomas Turber, the archaeologist who discovered the hoax. Professor Proch's work appeared to prove that anatomically, modern humans and Neanderthals had coexisted and perhaps even had children together. This now appears to be rubbish. The scandal only came to light when Professor Proch was caught trying to sell his department's entire chimpanzee skull collection to the United States. In an inquiry later established that he had also passed off fake fossils as real ones and plagiarized other scientists' work. His university inquiry was told that a crucial Hamburg skull fragment, which was believed to have come from the world's oldest German, a Neanderthal known as Hanhofer Sandman, was actually a mere 7,500 years old, according to Oxford University's radiocarbon dating unit. The unit established that other skull had been wrongly dated too. This is all recent stuff. Another of the professor's sensational finds, that's Binshoff Spire woman, lived 1,300 BC and not 21,300 years ago, as he had claimed. While Paterborn Sandman, he was dated 27,400, only died a couple of hundred years ago in 1750. He made those dates up. It's an embarrassment. This is recent. Professor Aldrich Brandt, who led the investigation into Professor Broch's activity, said yesterday, Professor Broch has refused to meet us, but we had 10 sittings with 12 witnesses. Their stories about him were increasingly bizarre. After a while, it was hard to take it seriously. You had to laugh. It was just unbelievable. At the end of the day, what he did was incredible. In one case, he had claimed that a 50 million year old half ape called Atopis had been found in Switzerland, an archaeological sensation. In reality, the ape had been dug up in France, where several other examples had already been found. It was just a recent ape. It was a lie. So you would think something happened in the past wouldn't happen today. Yet despite that, 
despite having no evidence, why does it still appear in the British Museum which says this? It says, there is now evidence that an early form of modern humans had evolved in Africa by about 100,000 years ago. They may have been our ancestors. They may have been our ancestors. There's your scientific proof. They may have been. That's what it is. That's, 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 that's we're dealing with science here. This is ridiculous. We get that all the time with science. May have been, may have been, probably. Here's another one. Look at the statement on the left says, they were probably the first people to bury their dead. Well, there you go, what proof? What more proof do you want? Probably that's what they did. And that's what we are brainwashing our kids with. That's what they see when they go to the British Museum. Is that necessary? Is that what they went to see? That's called slanted journalism. It happens all the time. You're probably used to it. They, it it's not unusual to use deceit to, to, to promote this, um, this theory because there is nothing else. Here's a famous evolutionist from Japan. He has been digging out archaeologists' finds and stunned people worldwide. You know what they called him? They refer to him as God's hands. Yes, that's right. The Guardian said, site after site, Fujimura discovered stoneware and relics that pushed back the limits of Japan's known history. The researchers and his Stone Age finds drew international attention and rewrote textbooks. He rewrote textbooks. His finds rewrote textbooks. And it's in museum everywhere. It, it went everywhere. It turned out to be a hoax. And this article appeared nearly in every newspaper in 2000 and 2001. It's recent. Here we go. The BBC showed these pictures of Fujimura. He was caught burying his own fossils in the ground. These are the pictures. That guy created so much publicity that everybody believed him since 1981. Look, a lot of people who went to school since 1981. And a lot of people have been told what he had found was all facts. Even Christians believed him. You, why do some Christians try to match the Bible with evolution? That's because people like that have been brainwashing our students for a long, long time. I'm just going to briefly cover two more, a couple more, and we're going to be done. It was technically called, this is Java Man. We're going to just talk about Java Man very quickly. It was technically called Pithecanthropus erectus. It means erect ape man. That's what it means. It was later called Homo erectus. Java Man was found in Indonesia in 1891, and that's about 120 years ago, in 1891. How many skulls do you think they found for this? Do you think maybe they found 100? 100 Java Man skulls? Maybe 50? How about 10? How about one? Did they find one whole skeleton? How about did they find half a skeleton for Java Man? Well, it turned out that all they found was one skull cap, one thigh bone, and two teeth. That's all they found. Now, here's the question. How did the British Museum down in London know that it looked like that? How did it know it looked like that? It gets more interesting. Here, look at this. The thigh bone was found one year later, and it was 50 feet away from the skull cap. And they assumed it was the same individual. Dr. Dubois is the guy who discovered these bones. And then he later found human skulls in the same place, but he hid them under his floorboards in his bedroom for 26 years. That's what he did. And before Dubois died, he confessed that he didn't find the missing link. He just thinks that it was probably a giant gibbon that he found, that he made that confession. It turned out that the thigh bones belonged to a human and the skull bone it belonged to an extinct gibbon, which is an ape-like creature. This appeared nearly in every American museum. It appeared in another place called Leyden uh, Museum in 1980. After it was discovered as a hoax for 50 years, it was kept in that museum for another 50 years. For nearly 100 years, students were told that this fossil was actually the missing link. Tell me, what would happen if you were going to school during that time and you were told that evolution is true? Would they unbrainwash you to tell you that it was all a hoax? They wouldn't. They would love you to keep that going. In fact, you know what, I found out that on the, on the internet, if you go on the website on Wikipedia, they still use this as evolution proof, even though it was discovered as a hoax. The other thing is, on the British Museum, it doesn't tell you it's a hoax. So when you go on their, on their website, it shows you this fossil as if it was a proof, no mention of the hoax anywhere. It gets better. Dubois, the guy who had this fossil, was actually a student of Ernst Haeckel. Ernst Haeckel himself was convicted of forgery. 
and I can give you the details later on. But who's Ernst Haeckel anyway? So let me take you through Ernst Haeckel very quickly. He was a German professor in a university in Jena. What was interesting is that Ernst Haeckel in 1874 was convicted himself of producing fake drawings of the embryo in 1874. This is, you've got to remember this. This is very important. Ernst Haeckel said the turning point in his thinking was when he read Charles Darwin's book. Ernst Haeckel became such a devoted evolutionist that he would do anything to prove the theory. So he became very desperate and he fabricated some drawings in 1869. That's what he did. That's how long ago? 150 years ago. He faked some drawings. Let me show you. He basically took a human embryo and he changed them. He faked it. He changed them so that it makes it look like as if a fish and a pig and all other animals look the same when they go through development. He presented this as evidence. He drew it himself. That's what he did. He was basically saying that we were going through some kind of a mini evolution inside the womb as we were developing. Because the theory goes that we went on from fish to amphibian to reptile to mammal. And he said, there you have it. I have proof. Now, if you compare that with the real photos, look at the top. That's the one he drew. Look at the bottom. That's the one that is the actual picture. They don't look like each other. He nearly single-handedly converted all the Germans to believe in evolution using these fake drawings. Bearing in mind that he produced those fake drawings himself, he said, when we see that at a certain stage, the embryos of man and ape, the dog and rabbit, the pig and sheep, though recognizable as higher vertebrates, cannot be distinguished from each other, the fact can only be elucidated, that means made clear, by assuming a common parentage. Ernst Haeckel was being deceitful. Five years later, in 1874, six of his own professors in his own university found out that he was being deceitful and he was convicted. And do you know what he said about that? He said this, a small percentage of my embryonic drawings are forgeries. Those namely for which the observed material is so incomplete or insufficient as to fill in and reconstruct the missing links by hypothesis and comparative synthesis. So he's saying, yeah, I made that up. That's what he said, I made that up. And then he went on to say, I should feel utterly condemned were it not that hundreds of best observers and biologists lie under the same charge. He said, don't judge me. I'm not the only one doing it. They're all doing it. That was his defense. That comment is actually on the internet right now. He said, oh, come on now, be fair. Look, I mean, all right, I did it, but they all do it. Okay, so leave me alone. So that was found 150 years ago. And here is the thing. Why is it still being used today? And our kids are still being taught this. You'll see in a minute. In this New Scientist article of St. George's Hospital Medical School in London, it said this, a set of 19th century drawings that still appear in reference books are badly misdrawn, says an embryologist in Britain, although Haeckel confessed to drawing them from memory and was convicted of fraud of the University of Vienna, the drawings persist. That's the real mystery, says Richardson. Yes, it is. This article appeared when, 1997. That's nearly 150 years ago. This book says, similar human and fish embryos resemble each other because humans and fish share a common ancestor. That was proven a lie 150 years ago. This biology book says, each embryo develops a tail, buds that become limbs and pharyngeal pouches, which contain the gills of fish and amphibians. The tail remains in most adult vertebrates. This was proven a lie 150 years ago. Here's another book. The, I have so many, but I had to resist putting them all in. The human embryo possesses a tail, much like those of our close primate relatives. This was proven a lie 150 years ago. This book says, embryos all have gill slits, segmented backbone, C-shaped bodies, and tails. This shows that the organism must have had a common ancestor. Please say it with me. This was proven a lie 150 years ago. This was proven a lie 150 years ago. Here's another book. Get ready. Gill slits and tails are found in fish, chicken, and pig, and human embryos. This was proven a lie 150 years ago. This is not science, right? This cannot be science. It's a religious statement that keeps saying again and again and again in order to brainwash you into this mentality that one way or another we have evolved. Well, listen, I don't mind if we have evolved. I'll be honest, I don't care. Well, I mean, obviously I care as a Christian because I know that it's not true. I'm not arguing with the theory. I'm arguing the fact that there is no evidence for it and it's still being taught as science. This is where my problem is. Put it in a religious classroom, I'm fine with that. And that's your theory. You can believe in whatever you like. 
but call, don't call it science and confuse our children. Here's the thing. Our students are being sent to school and they're learning this stuff. It was proven a lie 150 years ago. Tell me, who's going to fight this fight and fix it? We're sending our kids unarmed to schools to learn this stuff and expecting them to fight it. Why are we expecting our children who are being taught in schools, they should be taught the truth in schools, to be taught a lie and expect them to fight it? Why can't the grown-ups fight this one? Why are, we lying to, why are we letting our kids into a battle like that where they're being brainwashed with lies, proven 150 years ago? If you want some more information about this particular subject, there is a book called Icons of Evolution. We're building up a website called creationscience.co.uk where you're gonna, we're going to have a shop in there, an online shop where you can buy those kind of books that you can see pop up every now and then. Uh, it's not ready yet, but if you get this book, it tells you from a scientific point of view how we don't have gills, we don't have tails, and it builds on this information a little bit more. Now, here's the thing. If all these lies were taken out of the textbooks, all the books, museums, parks, TV, if they were all taken out, did you know there is absolutely nothing to support the theory of evolution? There's absolutely nothing. If you just take them out, take out the lies. I'm not telling them to take out the theory. Keep the theory going. You're happy with it. Makes you happy. Have it. Take out the lies. It's, not, it's fair, right? Okay? If you, if you told me today that the moon is made out of cheese, it's fine if you want to believe in that, but don't tell me they went and brought back some cheese. That would be a lie. Let's not do that. Let's just take out all the lies. And if you did that, there will be nothing left. Here's one called Orsman. It's very brief. It was found in southern Spanish town of Ors, or Orthe, if you're very posh, and I'm not. This is 1982. It was claimed that it was the oldest fossil human remains ever found in Europe. All they found is one fragment of one skull, not even a full skull. It's a fragment of one skull. Can you see the picture up there? Our trusted archaeologist said that this belonged to a 17-year-old man and who lived 900,000 to 1.6 million years ago. So the archaeologist stated this. He said it belonged to a 17-year-old man and lived between 900,000 and 1.6. They got so excited about this, right? You've got to hear this. They were going to throw a whole big party. So they got together. They're going to throw a big party. And just about before they did it, they discovered that it came from a donkey. Uh, I don't... I don't mean the archaeologist. This was a real donkey, and it was from a four-month-old donkey. Hope, grasshopper, hope, right? <laughs> they still refuse to accept this as a hoax or a misunderstanding on a fossil. They still use it as a proof, even today, as a missing link. Here's Peking Man. He was found in 1920 in China in a place called Peking in a cave. A cave was found with crushed skulls. They also found some tools. So they said, wow! There we go, we found it, the missing link. This is where humans have begun to learn how to use tools. Think about it, practicing on the heads. I mean, they found crushed skulls. It turned out that the crushed skulls belonged to monkeys, and they didn't tell anyone that they found 10 normal human remains in the same cave. All that it was happening is that there were some people in those days that liked to eat monkey brain. There are some cultures that do it today. That's all it was. They were crushing monkey brain skulls with a tool to eat it. No big deal. Oh, that's Peking Man, and there's your missing link. You can't take fossils from random places, put them together, and say these are missing links. You can't do it. You can't even do it with fossils that actually are identical. You can't do that. This annual review of ecology and systematics says there are not enough fossil records to answer when, where, and how Homo sapiens, that's intelligent human beings, by the way, emerged. No one knows what really happened. They don't have a clue. They don't have a clue. Don't let them fool you. This one says, fossil evidence of human evolutionary history is fragmentary and open to various interpretations. Fossil evidence of chimpanzee evolution is absent altogether. There are no evidence out there. Don't let them fool you in thinking there is any evidence. There is none. All they're doing, they've got this theory in their head, and they want to go and find something to fit the theory. They're not trying to find the answer. They're trying to find something that fits the theory. And if you want to do that, you can just about prove anything. I can prove stuff with people here. You can prove anything if you wanted to. If you really set your mind, that's not how it works. The evidence should lead to the theory and not the other way around. What's the bottom line? Bottom line is that macroevolution is not even wrong. If we don't see it happen, if it doesn't happen, then it doesn't happen. All right? So 
Macroevolution is not science. Don't let them fool you. Now we come to microevolution. This is basically a variation within a kind. This is going to be very, very quick. This is the only part of evolution that is science, and it's true. The evolutionist will use this part, where you have a variety, uh, a variation within one kind, to sell you the idea that you can also get the change that can occur from one kind of animal to another. That's what they're trying to do. I don't have enough time to get into this one. Basically, just because you can get a variety of dogs, it doesn't mean that that dog can become something else. That's just plain silly. There is a limit to what the dog can change to, and that's a dog. All right? It cannot change to any other kind of animal. And that is an absolute fact. In Genesis, it says, in chapter 1, if you read it, it tells you 10 times that everything brings after their kind. Everything brings after their kind. A dog will bring after dog. Cat, after its kind. Every animal will bring after its kind. A dog cannot produce a cat. A bird cannot produce a horse. A human cannot produce a donkey. Although sometimes that's debatable. Okay, so microevolution is science. Christians have thought of it first. It really does happen, but the problem here is that they're trying to sell you the other ideas of evolution. That's why it's very important you know what it means. If you know the meaning of evolution and you're discussing it with someone, ask them, what do you understand it to mean? If they mean, well, a variety, a variation within the kind, then that's fine. We're okay with that. That's science. But if they say anything else, then it's not science, and you've got to know what they're trying to tell you and what they're trying to sell you. Every other meaning of evolution is just religious. This one is not. Right, I think we're at the end now. So why I can't believe in evolution, these are the reasons why. First of all, is lack of scientific evidence. There's over 50 lies that supports this theory. There is no proof whatsoever. It's not real science. There are no fossil records. There is no billions of years. There is no geologic columns. None of those exist. I don't believe in it because of lack of logic. You can't just bring some incompleted fossil and line them up whichever way you like and say these are the links. You can't even do it if they look similar. Never mind if they look different. You can't just do that. That's not how it works. That's illogical. And I don't believe in it because of lack of purpose. If evolution is true, then life has no meaning. Life means nothing. You can't tell right from wrong. We can't even tell right from wrong if evolution is true. It becomes a subjective principle. It depends who you ask. Right and wrong will be dependent on the person you're asking. In order for you to know true right from wrong, it has to be objective. Only someone like God can give you true right and wrong. So, I hope you enjoyed <laughs> this talk. There are so many things I couldn't cover. I'm going to just tell you very quickly. I didn't cover all the lies of evolution. There's so much more in the lies. I didn't cover the principle of geology. I didn't talk about radiometric dating. I didn't talk about dinosaurs, mutations, DNA, vestigial organs, bird evolution, horse evolution, and, ev and finally, evidence of young Earth. These are all subjects that could have been covered but I think I probably need a whole week to do it all. Mm. But hopefully, if you enjoyed this, I can come back one day and maybe cover some of those subjects. But I hope you enjoyed this. And if there are any questions, please don't forget to put them in the box. I'll be happy to answer them. If it wasn't for being late, much later than I expected, I could have done them tonight. So God bless you. Thank you very much. I'll hand over to Andrew.